did this become a discussion on giant corkscrew penises? Well, hi there. Happy American Thanksgiving. This is a turkey. Alexander Hamilton apparently said that no citizen of the United States shall refrain from turkey on Thanksgiving Day. And not many do. We eat over 40 million of them each year for Thanksgiving dinner. But this command from Hamilton seems a bit odd given that there's no evidence that they ate turkey as part of the first Thanksgiving dinner in 1621. Though some of their closest relatives were almost certainly present. Relatives that you probably wouldn't have guessed are closely related to turkeys. Then why would Hamilton single out the turkey specifically? I suspect that it has something to do with a secret hatred that Hamilton had for another founding father, Benjamin Franklin. I mean, did you see Benjamin Franklin anywhere in Hamilton's musical? Even the darn fool that shot him had a major role. But Benjamin Franklin was conspicuously absent. Makes you wonder. Well, Benjamin Franklin was also a major advocate for the turkey. He didn't ever actually suggest that it should be our nation's symbol, but he did suggest that the turkey, whose head turns red, white, and blue during the breeding season, would be a better symbol than the bald eagle. For it is a noble and courageous bird, unlike the bald eagle, which he assessed to be a bird of bad moral character. Looks to me like Hamilton didn't care for that comparison one bit. And he took his shot at the poor turkey. He didn't throw that one away. But how much do you really know about turkeys? And would it shock you to learn that the close relatives of turkeys that were actually eaten on Thanksgiving were geese and ducks? Or that there are actually two different species of turkeys and you've probably only ever seen one of them? Well, let's not refrain from talking about turkeys this Thanksgiving day and all of their closest relatives because I think we're all into that kind of thing. All right, this is the moment that we've all been waiting for. The sponsor of today's video, Magic Spoon, has sent over my four favorite Magic Spoon cereals from all of our previous taste-offs. And today, I'm gonna find out which one is actually the best. Each serving of Magic Spoon cereal packs an impressive protein punch, boasting around 13 to 14 grams of protein. These cereals are keto friendly, containing just four grams of net carbs per serving, zero grams of sugar, gluten free, grain free, and no artificial colors or sweeteners. That's amazing! Basically, the cereal from your youth, but upgraded with grown up ingredients. So click the link in the description to get Magic Spoon cereal today. And if you use my code CLINT, you'll get $5 off. Magic Spoon stands firmly behind its product, offering a 100% satisfaction guarantee. If for any reason you're not satisfied with their cereal, they will gladly provide a no questions asked refund of your purchase. I have made a decision. Honey Nut and Birthday Cake, both very good. But this has only been a two horse race. And it was, it was the hardest decision I've ever had to make in one of these taste ops. But today, winner is, fruity with a caveat which is only that they're very they're a very different experience fruity is a circus in your mouth of just unbelievable flavor that i can't believe can exist in a sugar-free cereal or at all blueberry muffin is a much more subtle it's a delightful and pleasant experience right now i'm in the mood for like a lot of flavor but I could see how on a different day, you know, when I when I don't necessarily want a circus, blueberry muffin would be my favorite. So click on the link in the description or scan the QR code on the screen right there. Use the code CLINT for $5 off or go to magicspoon.com slash CLINT to save $5 on your order today. All right, so let's talk about turkeys and all their crazy relatives. Turkeys are part of the clade Gallo and Serre which means rooster goose. That's enough to make any serious Top Gun fan cry. It's also a pretty reasonable name for this clade. Previously, we discussed the clade Paleognathy, which is the clade of birds least related to all of the other extant birds. That is to say that it diverged away from the other birds before any of the other bird lineages diverged away from one another. But the second lineage to diverge away was this one the Galloanserae. The Paleognathy are the hagfish of birds, but the Galloanserae are the hagfish of the Neognathy. 
The Galloens area is composed of two major clades, the Galliformes, the roosterform birds, or landfowl, and the Anseriformes, the gooseform birds, or the waterfowl. Which means that turkeys and swans are closely related, which seems crazy, but starts to make more sense when you see this. This creature is a screamer. They get that name because they let out a loud scream whenever they encounter something new. Though I think it sounds more like a goose, which is interesting, because it looks more like a rooster. But it tends to live in and around water, yet its feet are not webbed, at least not very much so. So is it a rooster or a goose? Well, molecular analysis suggests that screamers are, despite their resemblance to galliform birds, actually basal members of the Anseriformes, which suggests that the common ancestors of the Galloanserae probably resemble more the galliform body plan, with the traditional duck body plan evolving more recently within the Anseriform clade. Sometime after, the ancestors of the screamers, the family Anhemidae, diverged from the rest of the clade. All three screamer species are found today only in South America. I honestly think they look a bit like African secretary birds, but with chicken bills and slightly stouter, more robust legs. After the screamer lineage diverged, but interestingly, still before the extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous, the family and Serenatidae diverged as well from the other members of the Anseriformes. This family is represented today by a single species, the magpie goose. And I want to be clear about this. Both of these lineages diverged before the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. This is important for two different reasons. First, it demonstrates clearly that birds, birds that would clearly be identifiable as birds, coexisted with the non-avian dinosaurs. It is a common misconception that the dinosaurs turned into birds, and that's where they all went. And while a few species may have evolved along those lines, the evolution of birds had nothing to do with the extinction of the dinosaurs. Rather, members of the avian lineage were the only dinosaurs that survived the events that wiped out all of the other lineages. We actually have a whole video about this from last Dinosaur December. Is anybody else as excited as I am for Dinosaur December to be back here in a couple of weeks? Make sure you have all of your notifications on if you don't want to miss that. Okay, so that was the first thing, but there is something else that is rad here as well. Not only did birds exist alongside the other dinosaurs, but multiple lineages survived and survive to this day. The screamer lineage diverged before the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs, and so did the Anserinatid lineage. This means that the ancestors of all three Anseriform lineages independently survived the extinction event that killed T. rex. Which is pretty rad. That said, the Anserinatid lineage today is represented by only a single species, the magpie goose of Australia and New Guinea. Now, I should mention that the magpie goose is not a true goose. And being the only surviving member of its lineage, it's more of a maverick than a goose. Oh, yikes, that had, that had two possible meetings. And one of them was yet another shot to the heart for us Top Gun lovers. I might need a minute. <sighs> but uh, anyway. It does have much more of the goose body plan, especially the bill, which likely developed that basic waterfowl shape somewhere between the divergence of the screamer lineage and the divergence of the magpie goose lineage, which again occurred before the end of the Cretaceous. But the magpie goose does look quite a lot like a goose. Uh, some ways to differentiate it, it is black and white, like a magpie, not all geese are black and white like that. It has relatively long yellow legs with toes that are only slightly webbed. And unlike true geese, it molts gradually and thus does not pass through a flightless stage like the last family of the Anseriformes. But like this last group of the Anseriformes, it has a penis. I'll talk more about that in a second. Because most of the penis-having birds in the whole world belong to the largest family of waterfowl. The family to which all but four of the 180 or so species of the Anseriformes belong, the Anatidae. Or, as you more likely know them, swans, geese, and ducks. Which appear to be basically arbitrary titles for different Anatids. There is no clear distinction between ducks, geese, and swans. Flat bill? Let's call you a duck. Taller bill? 
you can be a goose. Big long neck duck, you're a swan. And we'll mix in some other names like Merganser, Teal, Smew, Goldeneye, Scoter, Eider, Widgeon, Gadwall, Shoveler, Pintail, Pochard, Scalp, Shelled Goose, and Shelled Duck just so it isn't too easy to figure the whole thing out. Whatever you call them, this lineage that also independently survived the end Cretaceous mass extinction is clearly doing the best of all the waterfowl lineages. This family is generally herbivorous, though some, like mergansers, are highly carnivorous. They are generally kind of flat-bodied with their limbs closer to the rear. They are buoyant and float on the water's surface. But you know what they haven't lost? They're penises. Almost all birds lack penises, but most of the paleognathy and most of the waterfowl have them. Not the screamers, though. And the penises of waterfowl are notoriously extreme. Now, waterfowl are notorious themselves for being monogamous, or at least that is what we thought until we started doing paternity tests on their offspring. Turns out that they, uh, engage in a lot of extra pair copulations, though some are less promiscuous than others. Some even breed for life. But some are notoriously, uh, what's a polite word for forceful copulation? Well, they do a lot of that with their enormous prehensile corkscrew penises. And I think we should talk about that for a few minutes. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't you be a bit disappointed if we didn't? Okay, well, both magpie geese and anatids have penises. But whereas magpie geese mate on land, most anatids mate in the water. And there is a bit of an arms race going on under there. You see, generally for birds to mate, the female needs to present her cloaca to the male, who presses his cloaca to hers to seal the deal. And sperm is transferred faster than you can say ooby doob scooby dooby banooby via this cloacal kiss. Well, that's not how it works if you've got a penis. In fact, a male might swim next to you and ask if you know when the next migration is coming, and then BAM! Suddenly you're carrying his ugly little ducklings. And his genes might not be the best in the pool if you get my drift. So it is long behooved females to be rather difficult to inseminate. For example, the vagina of many anatids is shaped like a corkscrew maze with many pocket dead ends where sperm go to die if they aren't inserted perfectly. This makes the old swim by fertilization much less likely. Successful matings are much more likely to occur if the female allows the male to get into the correct position and take his time, maybe a second or two, to ensure that his sperm makes it to the end of the maze. And as the female vagina has become more elaborate and more difficult to navigate, the male penis has become longer, coiled, and elaborate as well. Some are even longer than the birds that possess them. And as there is always a fitness incentive for males that would otherwise not have opportunities to mate to find opportunities to mate, the arms race continues. And on that happy note, let's talk about turkeys. Aren't we supposed to be talking about turkeys? <laughs> when did this become a discussion on giant corkscrew penises? <laughs> and how many times can we say the word penis in a video before it becomes demonetized? Okay, turkeys! Turkeys don't have penises. In fact, their entire clade, the Galliformes, are cloacal kissers. No under the sea funny business from the rooster form birds, though they do tend to be pretty promiscuous. Sorry, Ben Franklin. Now, the Galliformes diversified from the Anseriformes before the screamers diversified from the rest of that clade. This means that the Galliformes definitely survived the end Cretaceous mass extinction independently from any other bird lineage. And the first lineage to diversify away from the rest of the Galliformes was the family Megapodiidae, which are also known as incubator birds or mound builders. One Megapodiid clade are even called bush turkeys, and they look a lot like turkeys. Even though of all of the Galliform birds, the Megapodiids are the least closely related to actual turkeys. Now, something that the entire Gallo and Sere clade has in common is that their offspring hatch out very well developed. They are called precocial offspring. Precocial meaning mature before its time. This is in stark contrast to many other bird lineages that hatch very underdeveloped, naked, blind, and helpless. These are called altricial offspring. Altricial referring to the need that they have to be nourished or nursed, though obviously not with milk as with mammals. So all members of the Gallo and Serre are precocial. But the 21 or so species of Megapodiids produce offspring that are what are called super precocial. 
Somehow, they hatch even more well-developed than a kiwi. They are the most fully developed of all birds at hatching. They hatch with full wing feathers, they can run, hunt, and some species can even fly on the day that they hatch. Most of them simply do not require parental care, and that's a good thing because their parents may not be anywhere around when they hatch. So who incubates the eggs? That's a great question. Did I mention that in addition to being able to run, hunt, and fly on the day that they hatch, they can also dig? Which is good because if they couldn't dig, they would probably die. Megapodiidae means great foot and refers to their burly legs and feet that they use to dig. Remember when I said that they're often called incubator birds or mound builders? Well, these guys don't incubate their eggs like most birds. They incubate their eggs like many of their closest living non-avian relatives, the crocodilians and turtles. They bury their eggs, either in a burrow or in an above-ground compost mound that they build with their great feet. The same great feet that their offspring will use to dig themselves out before flying away and that they also use to break out of their thinly shelled eggs since they have no egg tooth. Their feet can be used to distinguish them from most other members of the Galliformes, not only because of their robust size, but based on the location of their rear-facing toe, the hallux. In most Galliform birds, like turkeys, the hallux is not only rear-facing, but elevated off of the ground when walking. Not so with the Megapodiids. It's right on the ground with the other three toes. So if you're anywhere in Australasia and you see a turkeyish looking bird with its rear facing toe on the ground, pop out of a hole or a mound, look around and then fly away, well, you'll know what you have. I've probably spent too much time on them, but at the same time, I kind of want to make a whole video about this group alone. How cool are these guys? Oh, and to answer your question, yes, this group probably did diversify before the extinction event that killed the non-avian dinosaurs. Though the next group to diversify away from the turkey lineage may not have done so until after the end Cretaceous mass extinction, though the molecular evidence would suggest otherwise. And these are the family Crassidae of South Central and Southern North America. The approximately 56 species of Curaçaos, Guans, and chakalakas. This is another group of birds that look a lot like turkeys, unsurprisingly, though they tend to be long-tailed, smaller, and spend more time up in trees. This is reflected in the location of the hallux, which again is more on the same level as the other toes, not elevated. For this reason, many early phylogenies placed them with the megapodeids. Though subsequent molecular analysis has revealed that they're actually more closely related to all of the other galliforms than they are to the megapodeids. It is likely that the lower placement of the hallux is the ancestral condition, and it moved up after the Cresid lineage diverged from the other galliforms. Like turkeys, their body plumage tends to be fairly drab, but their heads can be quite spectacularly beautiful. And, like megapodeids, they hatch very well developed. While they are not as super precocial, they do often fly within just a few days of hatching. Not too shabby. Now, the rest of the Galliformes were a single lineage at the end of the Cretaceous and only began to diversify during the Eocene. And the first of these groups to diverge from the rest of the Galliformes is a family of birds that I personally do not like. And those would be the guinea fowl of Africa, the family Numididae, which I don't like because they are too good at getting run over by trucks. You see, when I worked at Disney's Animal Kingdom, many of my best friends were safari drivers. And I should mention that the second scariest part of being a safari driver is the fact that if you hit an animal, you are fired. Which means that you lose your job and your housing and your entire life essentially explodes. And there would be little excuse for hitting an animal. Well. Unless that animal is small, stupid, and likes to run under tires. I believe every guinea fowl that they had cost somebody their job. And that was the second scariest thing about being a safari driver. I'm just glad it wasn't my job. So I have a certain animosity towards guinea fowl. But that doesn't mean that they aren't a really cool group. Most are dark bodied and some have spots. One species, the vulturine guinea fowl, has some beautiful iridescent blue feathers as well. And then they have comparatively tiny, generally naked heads. Though one genus has crazy new kids on the block hair. Well, feathers. But 
You'll know which ones I'm talking about. The helmeted guinea fowl really looks like a tiny cassowary. It almost looks more like a double waddled cassowary than the dwarf cassowary does, and it's an actual cassowary. But unlike cassowaries, guinea fowl are great flyers. Despite the fact that they spend most of their time on the ground, following herds and troops of monkeys, eating the seeds that the animals deposit, as well as the arthropods that they attract, they can actually fly great distances. And this seems like a good time to discuss white meat versus dark meat. Which is better? Well, it depends. How long are you going to be flying? Or running? Or using that muscle? Many galliform birds are burst flyers. They generally walk or run, but when startled, they can absolutely explode into the air. Turkeys are a good example of burst flyers. Their flight muscles are composed almost entirely of fast twitch fibers. These fibers contract very quickly and provide a lot of power for a short period of time. They can explode into the air, but they won't stay up very long. This is because white muscle like this is very low in mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. Um, when I ask them, nobody ever knows what a powerhouse is. But what mitochondria do is they convert energy in the form of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins into a form that the cell can actually use for energy, adenosine triphosphate, ATP. And they do this using oxygen. This is actually the reason that you breathe in, to get oxygen to allow this process called aerobic cellular respiration to occur. In the end, aerobic cellular respiration produces ATP and also water and carbon dioxide. This water byproduct is the reason that camel humps are full of fat and not water. You can turn fat into water and ATP. Hooray! The CO2 is actually waste from the food that you ate that could no longer be used to make ATP and is expelled. That is why you breathe out. It's your lunch. And again, white fast twitch muscle is very low in mitochondria. This means that they can do very little aerobic respiration. So birds like turkeys can slowly load their muscles with ATP and then use it rapidly, but not for very long. They recharge very slowly. And if they tried to fly for very long, they have to use anaerobic respiration to make ATP. This doesn't require mitochondria or oxygen, but it makes very little ATP and it creates lactic acid as a byproduct in animals. This is what makes your muscles burn when you do a prolonged workout, and if you keep going, it will change the acidity of your muscles to the point that they will seize up, cramp, which puts a quick end to flight. So they fly hard, but not for very long before they have to stop and recharge for a very long time. They're like Teslas in, in ludicrous mode. Well, that wouldn't work for birds that need to fly farther. Birds like guinea fowl. These birds have dark, slow twitch muscles that are loaded with fats and mitochondria. They don't have the same amount of speed and power as the white fast twitch fibers, but they can recharge their ATP stores rapidly and without producing much lactic acid. It's the Toyota Prius of the sky. Another way to distinguish a guinea fowl from a cassowary, other than the flying and the fact that it's from Africa, would be by looking at their feet. They have a hallux. Cassowaries have none. And for the first time in the Galliformes, it's elevated, as it will be in the remaining two lineages. And while I will confess guinea fowl are actually pretty cool birds, I absolutely adore these last two clades. These last two are the most closely related clades among the Galliformes, being the New World quail, Odontophoridae, I love quail, and the turkey, and their rad cousins in the family Phasianidae. I love pheasants. Okay, let's start with the quail and save the turkey for last. I mean, you can't leave without learning about turkeys. What would Alexander Hamilton say? It's un-American! Quail. They're adorable. I love them. There are actually two groups of birds often called quail. Three, really. There are around 34 species of New World quail in the family Odontophoridae. That's what we're discussing now. There are also more than a dozen species of Old World quail that are all more closely related to turkeys than they are to the New World quail. And I said Old World quail in quotes because they aren't one another's closest relatives either. Basically any Phasianid that looks and acts sort of like an Odontophorid, uh, they called an Old World quail. But anyway, let's talk about the New World quail. I love them! Most of them are unsurprisingly found in the Americas, from Canada to Brazil. But a couple are from Africa, and a few have been introduced elsewhere, like New Zealand. 
New World quail are smallish, round, cute little birds that are shy and run around in adorable little families. I love them so much. Unlike guinea fowl, they have feathered heads and often sport fancy little head ornaments called plumes or top knots. Little families of cute little samurais just walking around in your neighborhood. I love them so much. They tend to walk and are burst flyers, so you know what their flight muscles look like. But you would never eat them because they're too cute for this world. I might need some quail in Clint's reptile room. We might need to do a video soon to find out if they're the best pet dinosaur for me. But when I think about getting a bird that looks like a dinosaur, I think of two groups, the Paleognathy, and we will be doing a pet video about one of them this December, just in case your notifications weren't turned on. But I also think of these. Is that not one of the most beautiful things you've ever seen? This is a golden pheasant. I do consider getting one. It is glorious, and that tail just brings that theropod profile together. It's perfection. Golden pheasants are part of the same family as the turkeys, Pheasianidae, along with about 184 other species, most of them being from the Old World, Africa, Asia, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand. Though grouse are circumpolar, and the turkeys, both species, are distinctly American. Isn't that right, Mr. Franklin? As are a few others. They are generally plump, heavy-bodied birds with short, round wings. Most, obviously not turkeys, have feathers on their heads. And some species have a spur on their leg above the elevated hallux. These are birds like pheasants, partridges, jungle fowl, the closest relatives to domestic chickens, turkeys, both species, old world quail, and peafowl, which are called real turkeys, pavo real in Spanish. There are also two species of those. Grouse, monals, prairie chickens, ptarmigans, capricailes, argus, burr fowl, francolins, and snowcocks. And phylogenetically, there is little rhyme or reason to the common names of any of these, but they are pretty cool. So let's take just a minute to talk about turkeys. I'd hate to be challenged to a duel because I refrain from talking about turkeys on Thanksgiving. There are two species of turkeys, one of them being the largest of all Fasianids. The species you're probably more familiar with is the wild turkey of eastern and central North America that has been domesticated and often appears in grocery stores around Thanksgiving, you know, to keep Hamilton on your side. Must be nice. Interestingly, the domestic turkey has been domesticated for around 2,000 years, so it wasn't Hamilton's close relatives that did it. You may be unfamiliar with the wild turkey's closest relative, the gloriously beautiful oscillated turkey of Mexico and that region. Turkeys are easily distinguishable by their naked heads and snoods. You know that crazy lump that suddenly enlarges and covers the beak of a turkey when it starts to strut? It's called a snood. I would like to shake the hand of whoever came up with that name. That's my kind of person. Tragically, the snood is often the target of attack from other turkeys. So to prevent complications from snood-related injuries, domestic turkeys often have their snoods removed by a process called desnooding. That's terrible. But you know what's wonderful? Snoods! Those suckers get up to six inches long when fully inflated. And they say that size doesn't matter, but they must not be talking about snoods because size totally matters. Females prefer to mate with long, snooted males, and other males also defer dominance to larger, snooted males. When it comes to snoods, size is everything. Kind of makes you wonder if Hamilton had a tiny little snood, doesn't it? The oscillated turkey of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, Belize, and Guatemala has a very similar overall shape to the wild turkey of the north. But they are smaller, and their bodies are much more colorful. Those eye spots on the tail feathers are the reason for their name. And both sexes have blue heads. Even the snood is blue. Blue snood. I saw him standing alone. That snood it was so long. I had to make him my own. And now you know. Which group should we cover next? As always, <laughs> like and subscribe. <laughs> we hope to see you real soon. What the heck was that? Suddenly you're singing. What is that? Makes you wonder. What? <laughs> Come on. So much.
much in you end up. All right, let's do this, people. We'll do it live! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> scared me. <laughs> I'll fire her after that. And sperm is transferred faster than you can say. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Are we gonna be demonetized? I, I, maybe. I think we need to do like parental warning at the beginning of this video. Jeez. <laughs> Lots of talk of penises. <laughs> Just tell that as the warning. For, for sensitive viewers. Parental warning. Fair. There's a lot of penis talk in this. <laughs> Much discussion of penises. Brandon watches our channel when he goes to sleep. <laughs> 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 Might have a interesting um, drinks. Yep. <laughs>